the modern denial of human nature, number 10 on this week's New York Times bestseller list. In the book, Professor Pinker argues that genetics is a main component in human nature. This talk runs an hour and 25 minutes. Thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and be able to welcome you to our home. Uh, we also have a brand new building at 505th Street, which we're very proud of, which we just moved into this summer. Before introducing the speaker, let me just take this opportunity to introduce the academies. Uh, we call ourselves now the National Academies. I'm the president of one of those, the National Academy of Sciences. There are also two other presidents upstairs, National Academy of Engineering and the Institute of Medicine. Together, these three honorary organizations have about 5,000 members. And then there is an operating arm in the National Research Council that completes this uh, organization, which is why we call ourselves the National Academies, because it's just too complicated. Our major function, besides honoring uh, outs uh, outstanding scientists and engineers, is to carry out uh, studies for the U.S. government uh, on any matter of science or technology that they need advice on. Uh, most recently, we completed a very major effort uh, publishing an uh, important report on science and technology for countering terrorism, uh, an effort that involves some 120 volunteer uh, committee members. So it's a major effort that's been playing directly into the plans for the new Department on Homeland Security. Well, I invite you to visit us not only in person but on the web. Uh, all of our reports, more than 2,500 of them, are, can be read directly online. Today's lecture, of course, is by Dr. Steven Pinker. He's a professor of psychology in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His research has focused on visual cognition and on the psychology of language. He, turns out he received his undergraduate degree from McGill University and his PhD in psychology from Harvard. He was on the faculties of Harvard and Stanford universities before moving to MIT in 1982. He's uh, received from this academy on this stage, the year before I became president, 1993, uh, one of our awards called the Trollin Research Award, which we give to young investigators to recognize unusual achievements. It's only 10 years ago, he's still pretty young. <laughs> He's also won numerous other awards, including two from the American Psychological Association and, I think, very importantly, uh, teaching awards for his uh, service to students and the next generation of researchers at MIT. He has, of course, written several best-selling books. He and he's won uh, multiple awards for two of his popular science books, The Language Instinct and How the Mind Works. He also writes frequently for the pop popular pre press, including the New York Times, uh, Time Slate, and the New Yorker magazines. Uh, the, the topic tonight, of course, is the topic of his latest book. I don't really have to say the title. <laughs> it's up there in a beautiful form. Uh, it's already been announced that he will be doing a book signing, but in addition, what wasn't announced, there will be some refreshments afterwards in the Great Hall so please join me in welcoming Dr. Pinker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Everyone needs a theory of human nature. Everyone has to anticipate the behavior of others. And that means we all need theories, tacit or explicit, about what makes people tick. So much depends on our theory of human nature. We use our conceptions of human nature to manage our relationships, to bring up our children, to control our own behavior. The assumptions uh, about learning in our theory of human nature guide our policies in education. Its assumptions about motivation guide our policies in law and government. And because a theory of human nature delineates what we can achieve easily, what we can achieve only with sacrifice or pain, and what we cannot achieve at all, it affects our values, what we think we can reasonably strive for as individuals and as a society. It's no surprise, then, that for millennia, theories of human nature were tied up in religion. 
And indeed, the Judeo-Christian uh, theory of uh, human life as it evolved over centuries has commitments about what we would today consider to be the subject matter of psychology and biology. For example, in the Judeo-Christian theory, the mind is a system with a number of faculties, such as a capacity for love, a moral sense that presents us with standards of right and wrong, and an ability to make choices, which is free in the sense that it isn't uh, subject to the laws of cause and effect. Uh, we have free will, uh, but it has an innate tendency to choose sin. Uh, <laughs> In this theory, there's also an um, explanation for uh, how perception and cognition work. Uh, we know the world because God designed our mental faculties to be in synchrony with the way the world is. And there's even a theory of mental health, that mental health comes from accepting God's purpose, uh, from loving God and loving our fellow humans for the, God's sake. Now, the Judeo-Christian theory uh, was motivated by particular events narrated in the book of Genesis. For example, the doctrine of free will comes from the part of the Genesis story that says that Adam and Eve were punished for eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge, which implies that they could have chosen otherwise, which implies that free will exists. Now today, no scientifically literate person can believe that the events narrated in Genesis literally took place. And as a result, uh, there's been a need for a different grounding of human nature. And with the decline of fundamentalism, I think that modern intellectual life tacitly committed itself to three doctrines, each of them associated with a dead white male. Uh, the first is the blank slate, or the tabula rasa, commonly associated with this man, John Locke, although a uh, search of his writings, which is now easy to do because they're all on the internet, uh, shows that he actually never used the expression blank slate. But here's what he did write. He said, let us suppose the mind to be, as we say, white paper, void of all characters without any ideas. How comes it to be furnished? Whence comes it by that vast store which the busy and boundless fancy of man has painted on it with an almost endless variety? Whence has it all the materials of reason and knowledge? To this I answer, in one word, from experience. Now, the blank slate uh, is a doctrine with a great deal of moral and political appeal. In Locke's time, it implied that dogmas, such as the divine right of kings, were not self-evident truths implanted into our brains, but rather they had to be justified by experiences that people shared and therefore could debate. It undermines a hereditary royalty and aristocracy who could claim no more uh, grounds for virtue and wisdom if their minds started out as blank as everyone else's. <laughs> and by the same token, it undermined the institution of slavery because slaves could no longer be held to be innately inferior or subservient. And uh, this set of ideas is nicely captured in the following cartoon that I clipped out of The New Yorker where one king says to another, I don't know anything about the bell curve, but I say heredity is everything. <laughs> now, we continue to see an influence of the blank slate in modern intellectual life, and sometimes in unexpected places. Psychology, for most of the 20th century, tried to explain all human behavior through a few simple mechanisms of association uh, and conditioning. The social sciences try to explain all cultural and social patterns through uh, the idea of socialization and culture as an autonomous force. Um, here is an example from a prominent social scientist of the 20th century who wrote, with the exception of the instinctoid reactions in infants to sudden withdrawals of support and to sudden loud noises, the human being is entirely instinctless. Man is man because he has no instincts, because everything he is and has become, he has learned, acquired from his culture, from the man-made part of, of the environment, from other human beings. And that's a quote from the anthropologist and public intellectual Ashley Montague. Here's another example uh, of how widespread the doctrine is. Um, I think of a child's mind as a blank book. During the first years of his life, much will be written on the pages. The quality of that writing will affect his life profoundly. And that is a quote from Walt Disney. <laughs> now, there, there's a second doctrine that often accompanies the blank slate, which uh, comes from 
uh, whose name comes from a poem by John Dryden called The Conquest of Grenada. I am as free as nature first made man, ere the base laws of servitude began, when wild in woods the noble savage ran. Now the noble savage is more commonly attributed to this man, the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And here's what Rousseau actually uh, did write. So many authors have hastily concluded that man is naturally cruel and requires a regular system of police to be reclaimed, whereas nothing can be more gentle than him in his primitive state. The more we reflect on this state, the more convinced we shall be that it was the best for man, and that nothing could have drawn him out of it but some fatal accident which should never have happened. The example of the savages seems to confirm that mankind was formed ever to remain in this condition, that it is the real youth of the world, and that all ul ulterior improvements have been so many steps in appearance towards the perfection of individuals, but in fact towards the decrepitness of the species. Now you can't really understand someone unless you know who he was arguing against, and indeed Rousseau was arguing against uh, so many authors, and the main author that he had in mind was this man, uh, in particular the following passage. Hereby it is manifest that during the time men live without a common power to keep them all in awe, they are in that condition which is called war, and such a war is of every man against every man. In such condition there is no place for industry, because the fruit thereof is uncertain, and consequently no culture of the earth, no navigation, no commodious building, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. This, of course, is the famous passage from Thomas Hobbes's Leviathan. Now, there's a great deal of appeal to the doctrine of the noble savage, which Rousseau used to oppose Hobbes. If, uh, in a state of nature, we are naturally peaceable, then there's no need for a domineering leviathan, a government and police force, to keep us uh, from each other's throats. If we're basically nasty, then conflict is a permanent part of the human condition. Whereas if we're basically noble, we can work for a utopian society of the future. Children are born savages, so if the inner savage in us is nasty, then child rearing must be an arena of discipline and conflict, Whereas if the savage in us is basically noble, then child rearing consists of providing children with opportunities to develop their potential. Like the blank slate, the noble savage has had a widespread influence in modern intellectual life. We see it in the respect for everything natural and the distrust of anything man-made. Natural pharmaceuticals, natural foods, natural yogurt, natural childbirth, and so on. We see it in the unfashionability of authoritarian styles of child rearing. We see it uh, in the understanding of social problems as repairable defects in our institutions, as opposed to a more traditional view in which they would be seen as part of the inherent tragedy of the human condition. And there's a third doctrine that uh, goes along with the noble savage and the blank slate, commonly associated with this gentleman, the philosopher René Descartes. Descartes wrote, when I consider my mind, I cannot distinguish any parts, but apprehend it to be clearly one and entire. The faculties of willing, conceiving, etc., cannot be said to be its parts, for it is one the same mind which employs itself in willing and in feeling and in understanding. But it is quite otherwise with corporeal objects, for there is not one of them imaginable by, by me which my mind cannot easily divide into parts. This is sufficient to teach me that the mind or soul of man is entirely different from the body a doctrine which s several centuries later was derided as the doctrine of the ghost in the machine by the philosopher Gilbert Ryle. And no, the police did not invent that term in the album by that name. They stole it from Ryle. <laughs> the ghost in the machine uh, also has a great deal of moral and emotional appeal. Um, people don't like to think of themselves as glorified uh, gears and springs. Uh, because m machines are insensate, built to be used and disposable, whereas humans are sentient, possessing of dignity and rights, and precious, a notion that seems to come out of the doctrine that we have a soul that's separate from the mechanism of the body. Machines have some workaday purpose, like grinding corn or sharpening pencils. 
Humans, uh, we like to think, have a higher purpose. Love, worship, good works, knowledge, beauty. Machines follow the ineluctable 